Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It looks like everyone's pretty well situated, and if we have some stragglers, more the merry. But I'm going to go ahead and keep us on our hour um, time pattern. Um, good afternoon. You are in Assessing the Quality of Online Instruction presentation. My name is Mimi O'Malley. I am a Professional Development Administrator here at the Learning House. And my responsibility is to help manage and in some cases teach our best practices courses, uh, BP 101, BP 102, and BP 103. My background here is I've been an employee of the Learning House for three years. I used to work in the curriculum department. In fact, my coworker Erin, who's sitting behind the laptop here, she and I worked together uh, in curriculum and moved into training in January. Um, I am also an academic librarian by training. Um, I'm also an author. I've written three books. Uh, any of you diehard Kentuckians, uh, take a look at these at your local Carmichael's, Amazon, or Barnes & Noble. Um, I have worked in academic libraries for about five years, uh, both at the community college here down the street, Jefferson Community and Technical College, as well as Sullivan University, which was a for-profit university. Um, my co-presenter today is Dr. Dave Kleinfelter. Uh, you all had heard from Dave in our welcome address, and um, he will give a little bit more information about this topic momentarily. But first things first, uh, we are going to cover an, a new evaluation tool that we worked on. I was the lead uh, researcher, and Dave and another coworker of mine, Diane Castle-Hutt, uh, really were the kind of peer reviews of the actual tool. So today, you are the lucky ones who are getting to the first unveiling of this particular product. Um, so, first things first, what we're going to cover in today's session is discuss the reasons for evaluating online delivery. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and highlight some of the research that went into developing this online delivery course tool. Uh, also, I'm going to discuss some of the key areas associated and that's essential for online quality course delivery. I'll also present some of the challenges that came up when we were trying to develop an evaluation tool. I'll actually get into the evaluation tool and its specific standards. And then finally, we'll wrap up discussion with recommendations for usage. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before I actually get into the presentation. Since this presentation is being recorded, uh, if any questions we'll probably do towards the end of the presentation. Since I've been informed, we'd like those who have questions to go to the microphone to ask questions so that it's captured on recording. For those of you who would like a paper copy of this actual evaluation tool rubric, I have copies in the very back, uh, kind of on the desk right by the gentleman with the gray shirt. Uh, if you want to move that, sir, you can go, go right ahead. Um, I also have business card back there if you need to contact me if you have further questions. And I also have a copy of our quality review uh, form that I'll discuss a little bit in the presentation. Okay. This is where I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Kleinfelter because he's going to tell you a little bit about why evaluate course delivery. And David, go, go right for it. Thanks, Mimi. Can you hear me okay? The mics are working. You know, uh, this reminds me of an early experience in my career. I was a high school principal at age 27, I think it was. And part of my duties was to observe the faculty and there was a set procedure where like three times a year I was supposed to observe each of the faculty members in my school. And so I'd schedule an appointment and I'd go in the back of the room. You've seen this happen when you were in high school or any high school teachers here that went through this or even some college professors, right? So uh, here I am, 27 years old, freshly minted, you know, doctoral degree and I'm in this high school. And these, the faculty, I was the youngest person, I think, in the building. The faculty were 25, 30-year veterans, you know. So it was kind of an intimidating experience when you think about it, to go in and sit there and watch a math professor. I was an English major when I was an undergrad. 
uh, teach you know, statistics or something and I'm supposed to give them feedback and help them improve the quality of their teaching. Or I remember Dottie Zayer, she was a wonderful teacher. She was the business teacher, you know, did the yearbook and all this. And, and uh, she was very popular, well-respected faculty member. And uh, my job was to observe her and give her feedback, you know. Uh, luckily, in that process, uh, in grad school, I had come across a system called the Observational System for Instructional Analysis, OSIA. It was actually designed at the University of Illinois, and then I picked it up where I went to grad school. And it was a system back in those days, in the 70s, where you would rate the communication that was happening in a classroom. So if the teacher was talking, if they were lecturing, or if they were asking questions, or if they were commenting and responding, there were like 13 different categories, and every four seconds you were supposed to tick off what kind of conversation was going on in the classroom. And then they were trying to chart this out without computers or early computers to see how much teacher talk, how much student talk, and what kind of, and learn about instruction through this. So I naturally fell into this habit of just kind of recording what was happening in the classroom. And it was observing. And actually, at first, when I started, it was an intimidating kind of experience, but it, it turned out to be a very positive uh, activity for me, one that I enjoyed doing and working with my faculty. Uh, and the old folks were kind to me, you know, the young guy and so forth. And mostly, though, when, when you go in there and you do kind of an objective, here's what I saw, here's what happened, it turns into a dialogue. You know, it's not me telling them what they should be doing. It's a dialogue about, Here's what I saw, you know, here's what I was trying to accomplish. We started doing pre and post conferences, which is a good practice to say, what are you trying to accomplish in this lesson that I'm going to observe? What would you like me to look for? How can I be helpful? So it really became a good partnership in many ways, as I'm an objective person that can sit there and give them feedback and uh, not somebody who's going to play gotcha. It's like Ken Green said earlier about the data, it's not a weapon. It's, it's using it to help people get better and, and support them. So I started picking up things like, here's a really great practice or a great lesson that somebody ran. And sometimes then I could recommend that they go talk with somebody else in the building who was trying to do something similar. Or you'd find great ideas, people that would maybe give a presentation at an upcoming faculty meeting about a great resource they were using. That whole process of observing the faculty, giving them feedback, discussing what they were doing, and uh, sharing with them turned out to be a positive kind of experience that was really reinforcing for me, and, and uh, it was a good experience for all of us. In many ways, this, this tool that Mimi's developed does the, it creates the same opportunity for you folks. It's not this observational system, but it is a way to objectively look at a classroom track what's happening there, in this case it's the online classroom, and record data about the, about the observations. It's a tool, it's a rubric. You know, when you teach your classes, I always talk to, like to have a good rubric to assign student grades. I think a good, well-written rubric that lists the criteria and what's good, middle, you know, not so good in that assignment, takes away the argument. The students don't want to argue with you about the grade if you have a good rubric because it's right there. The student can fill out the rubric or I can fill it out or Mac can fill it out. And it's the same kind of objective uh, data about did they do well on this assignment or did they not. It's the same thing here. If the rubric will give you good kind of objective data, whether you filled it out or the faculty member did it for themselves, about that class and that experience, and it's a place to start the discussion. It's not a weapon, but it's a place to help people get better. When I realized that my observation was a support system, it was a way for me as a principal to show my faculty members I cared about them. I cared enough to spend my time to go talk with them, to think about their classes, to have that dialogue. And the same thing happens at the college level. When I was a dean of faculty at a college like many of you work, my job was to observe the department chairs because their job was to do their regular faculty members. And so I had the same process that works there. And when you approach it in that way, it can be a positive growing experience for everyone involved. There was a, uh, a study that came out just last week. Inside Higher Ed, the magazine or the online journal, sponsored this with the Babson group, the survey research group. 
In fact, Doug Letterman is speaking tomorrow. He's the editor at Inside Higher Ed. I think he'll talk about this study. But I went through it. They were, this was a survey of faculty members and their attitudes and, and beliefs about online education. And uh, one of the questions was, uh, my institution has good tools in place to assess the quality of online instruction. And this is like 5,000 faculty members from around the country. And they're asking them, does your institution know what good online instruction is? And only 27% said yes of, of all the faculty. Then they broke it down by the faculty that teach online, people that are actually working in online. And only 38% of them said that their institution had a good way to assess quality. So this rubric, along with the companion rubric on curriculum or course review that Learning House has developed are two good tools that if you use them at your institution, you can have a discussion about what is quality. And uh, I would encourage you to engage the faculty too to look at these rubrics and you may not agree with all this, so you may want to change a few of the items on there, that's okay. Uh, but getting a discussion going about what is a quality course, what is a quality instructional behavior pattern in a course can make a big difference and it's a place where everybody can uh, get together and uh, the responses to these questions should be different. This picture is one that I picked a while ago. I'm a fairly avid gardener. I, I love to get out there and mess around in the dirt. And uh, in fact, I left my home Monday. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'll be home Thursday night. Probably the first thing I'll do when I get home is go out and check the garden, see which plants I'm growing here, what's going on. You know, it's kind of a fun thing that I do. Uh, but I think about the, the, the plants and how you have to take care of them, you know, and nurture them to get them to grow the way you want them to. I actually planted some horseradish a year ago. And I was reading about horseradish plants, and it's the one plant that I've seen in, in the, the books and stuff that says, just stick it in the ground and leave it alone. Just go away, forget about it, don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself, and it'll keep growing roots and multiplying and so forth. Most plants aren't like that. Uh, most of them lead, need some attention. You start with good nutrients in the soil. The soil is the most important part there. Uh, my wife and I actually rented a plot in the community garden this year. And it uh, turns out the soil is terrible. They, t they tore out an old dump and brought in new dirt and filled it up, big grant from the government. And they brought in a bunch of old clay that's very alkaline and nothing will grow there. You know? So it's a bad experience. You start with good nutrients in the soil. And it's kind of like with this rubric. Start with good expectations. So everybody knows what good teaching is. We have a common understanding of what really first class, high level teaching and interaction in the classroom is about. It's kind of like the nutrients. And uh, you know, when you, you go in there, it's every so often I have to go through the kale plants and pick off these little green bugs that grow there and squish them, you know. You gotta pay attention to things like that to nurture them. And in some ways, it's like doing these observations. You gotta go check. Every week I check those plants to see what bugs are eating them now and how to take care of that. And my wife's the big waterer. She loves to get out and turn the hose on and water them because she thinks they always, in the kind of heat we've had the last couple weeks, you can see how important that is. And in many ways, that's like the training that goes with this. It's, it's helpful to have a rubric like this, an observational system, and go, go look. But once you find that, too, the next follow-on piece is how can we help our faculty get better? Well, offer workshops and classes and training programs. And in many cases, when you're doing the observations, you'll find great examples. And it's a nice faculty development opportunity to say, you, know, you did a really good job in this lesson. Would you do a presentation or a workshop for the rest of the faculty? It becomes a reinforcing kind of concept. And it's like watering these plants. It just keeps growing and helping things go forward. To me, the, the big payoff, though, is, is uh, actually, this just happened. We just harvested the first uh, lettuce and some kale and so forth from the garden. It's finally got ready. And when you get those first cuttings or those first vegetables or fruits, or whatever you're growing, there's this huge payoff. And uh, that's what happens with our students. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear that uh, 
the way the faculty member behaves in the classroom, the quality of discussion and interaction, as I mentioned this morning, makes a big difference in the student experience, makes a big difference in retention, makes a big difference in student satisfaction. I think as we get more institutions using our assessment tool, it'll show a big difference in student learning as well. But I know it's, it makes a difference in terms of satisfaction and in terms of student retention. So the real payoff here, the real fruit of this effort is better experience for our students. Our students really get through, get out of that class what they need and, and get on to graduation. So that's enough about why we do this. I'm glad to talk more about that whole process and how you use it in a positive, constructive way and not as a weapon like, like Casey said. But let's turn it over to Mimi now to find out what this instrument really is behind it and what it's all about. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, as Dave was alluding to, the quality. Um, we, quality doesn't just come about. Um, what are some of the best quality online instruction practices? And in order to know that, we had to go and find research about it. And what we developed was there were four main bodies of work that seemed to allude to quality online instruction. And those bodies of work are highlighted in these four. The first one, and some of you may be familiar with this, Arthur Chickering and Zelda Gamson um, took all of their um, practice, um, personal knowledge back in 1987, and they pulled together all of those um, strategies and key behavioral components in undergraduate education instruction, and they presented this, this seminal literature called the Seven Principles for good practice in undergraduate education. Now the online environment has actually incorporated these seven principles in varying degrees. Uh, for instance, the Ohio Learning Network, some of you may be familiar with, and even Penn State University actually incorporated this document and reverted it for a peer review for many of their distance learning programs. In 1999, 19 Maryland colleges and universities launched a consortium that offered both certificates and degrees online. It was such a successful consortium that it developed into Quality Matters, which I think many of you are probably very well aware of, especially for course design. Um, here at the Learning House, we have used Quality Matters to actually um, develop our own course design quality review form. And I have copies of this on the back table as well. Some of your institutions often have the Learning House do this for your courses. The quality review, or I'm sorry, the quality matters rubric actually has eight standards. And of those eight, there are actually three standards that overlap into quality course delivery, uh, those being course overview and introduction, uh, learner interaction and engagement, and student support. Now, Quality Matters not only will train online faculty members, but it's also a peer review process. And uh, of course, they also market their own rubric, rubric as well. The University of South Florida's College of Public Health was actually one of three University of South Florida colleges that participated in a 2005 federally funded uh, project that was titled Innovations in Teaching and Learning. And that particular project evaluated uh, learning models, not only for asynchronous communication, but also synchronous communication and instruction. And the COPH produced a rubric that actually evaluates some of the elements from the Quality Matters rubric, but it also expanded on uh, student pacing, uh, instructor interaction with students, feedback, and even student collaboration. And finally, California State Ch University Chico actually has their own uh, online instruction rubric. And again, they took best practices not only from Quality Matters, but they also incorporated some of the Chickering and Gamson best practices, as well as incorporated learning styles into their rubric. And they used their rubric, which consists of six categories, and they use it for three purposes. One, they use it not only as an instructor self-evaluation tool, but they also use it as a way to award exemplary courses. 
And finally, they'll use it as a foundation for their own course design. So among these four key tools, we started to see common themes. And those themes were instructor-student interaction, uh, student time on task, feedback, and instructor participation. And those are really the elements that we developed to make our own six quality standard rubric. All right. However, before we actually get into the rubric, uh, there are some challenges that we came across in the development of it. Um, primarily, we discovered we had to figure out what's the purpose of this tool and who's the audience for this tool. For example, designer delivery. Uh, we came across a real problem that when we called together all of those standards from those four basic research, we came up with 85 standards. And I'm sure many of you who have ever, ever had to evaluate something know 85 standards for one course is a little bit of a large task to accomplish. So we had to do a little bit of shutting. Um, and so what we did is we really took our quality review form and we made sure we took out any kind of components that dealt with course design. Um, we also wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't duplicate any of those course design elements. We also know many of our institutions allow instructors to make editing changes to their courses. However, we also have institutions who do not allow their instructors to make any ed editing changes. Um, so we had to create a rubric that was um, designed for those instructors who may not have editing rights. Um, some, in, some departments actually have instructional design departments, and your institution may actually be one of those. Um, but we also have institutions who don't have separate ID departments. So we had to kind of factor into those. Um, and we had difficulties in distinguishing the line between what's design and what's delivery. So we really had to choose that line of demarcation as interaction. So that interaction we really honed in on was instructor-student interaction, student-to-student uh, -student interaction, and content-to-student interaction. Another challenge we had was how are we going to measure it? Uh, this is one of the um, problems when you're looking at standards and you're trying to take a qualitative possibly objective standard and figure out how do I measure it. For example, quality matters rubric and the California State University rubric, they both had a particular standard for including multiple activities to help students develop their critical thinking and problem solving skills. Well, that may be well, good and well, but how do you benchmark an evaluator is going to qualitatively measure critical thinking? For example, what if your evaluator isn't a subject matter expert for that course they're evaluating? How are they, he or she, going to know what is a higher level of critical thinking? So this is really important. Um, also, what is going to be a benchmark for knowing whether or not that student met that high level of quality thinking? So these are the kind of uh, qualitative areas we had some challenges in trying to address. So uh, after weeks of discussion and beta testing, we got 85 standards. We got it down to six. And as Dave knows, it was a very uh, painstaking process. It probably took over the course of about six to 10 weeks. Uh, we fleshed out all the course design components. And we specifically dealt with instructional interaction elements. Now, many of the literature reviews also mention that group work and synchronous sessions are a very valuable component to online courses, but we know many institutions do not require group work or synchronous sessions as part of their online courses. So group work and synchronous session are actually optional um, standards. We can evaluate, but it's not mandatory. All right. So what we came up with 
And before I go into the actual standards themselves, I want to caution you that what you'll see on the screen are actually verbiage that came from actual online courses uh, that we went and uh, as we were going to measure these. So our first standard was the instructor creating a social presence and availability. Uh, we have found in the research that instructor engagement even at the basic level, builds a social rapport in distance learning designs. And many of you probably already know this. Research has noted that instructor social presence forms a relationship between the perception of interaction and the quality as well as quantity of student learning. This instructor's response to a student certainly doesn't demonstrate any kind of social rapport or social presence which is one of our first standards in our rubric. Um, as you can see, this is a rather unsupportive and highly unmotivating response uh, to any student. All right. When we evaluate an instructor's ability to build community and a social presence, we're really going to start looking at the course's initial news forums, um, any kind of announcements the instructor may make, um, even in the first week's discussions uh, forum postings. We're going to see if there's like an icebreaker activity, um, there's personal interaction that instructor's giving, personal information about themselves, just to kind of get students um, feeling a little bit of that warm and fuzzy. Okay. Our next standard that we look for is certainly feedback. And one of the most important elements for a quality online course delivery is feedback. In fact, without a social presence or that physical presence, an online instructor really has to rely on their virtual presence. And that can be often communicated in the form of both quality and quantity of written feedback. The quality of written feedback is one of the standards that our rubric is going to go ahead and evaluate. And in this particular example, uh, this instructor's weekly discussion forum post, you'll notice that the instructor literally gave just about the same response, give or take a few words, to the same three students. And looking further in this week, we found that this instructor literally gave the same response to every student who posted um, in this particular forum posting, the same response. Now, what the instructor could have done, since it seemed to be the students were having a problem on balance sheets um, and rolling over, was probably make a news forum announcement, a general announcement to the class, um, letting them know where they could find information, possibly back in the textbook. Um, also, maybe even refer students to an outside resource, be that a tutorial or maybe an additional uh, workbook page, since it's being an accounting class. There are other t LMS tools the instructor could have used to make a general announcement. Um, I do also want to make a little bit of a plug here, um, because tomorrow at 10.15, uh, there will be a uh, workshop on incorporating library resources into your online course. This would have been a great example of where an instructor could have possibly used some of their campus library resources um, to steer students to for help on this. Okay? So another standard that we are going to measure in our rubric is also grading. And instructors giving grade prompt grading is also a form of feedback. Industry standards seem to determine that grading within seven days of an assignment is pretty typical for an online course instructor. So in this example, we looked at lesson two for this particular economics course. And we compared the original due date that was listed in the LMS, it's over in the left-hand column, which was January 29th. I'm sorry if you can't quite read that too well. And we compared it against the actual dates that the instructor input the grades in the LMS gradebook. We noted overall that this instructor took nine days before he or she began to grade this lesson two assignment. So normally what we suggest is that when you are looking at grading, uh, examine about 
three lessons in a particular course. Ideally, first, middle, and end. That kind of gives you a good range as to, do you see, uh, maybe they started out grading very strongly in the beginning of the course and slacked off towards the end of it. Uh, when we are evaluating these courses, uh, we did look at generally two, if not three, lessons to really give the benefit of the doubt to the instructor. Okay. All righty. Next standard we looked at is student retention. Researchers note that the instructor is really the key to student retention in an online course. And why is that? Because the instructor gives life to static course material and also promotes organized learning. Now, although instructors should certainly reach out to missing or non-participatory students throughout the whole course term, for this particular standard, we really chose to highlight the first five days of the course. Um, especially that's um, really helping out on student uh, retention, promoting uh, persistence as well. Um, instructor communication during these initial first days will kind of determine whether or not you can kind of keep that student in that course rather than dropping it. In this particular example, uh, you can see that this is taken from one of our own best practice courses and our instructor actually contacted this particular missing student two days into the course to make sure that he or she was continuing with the class. And I do want to add a little bit of note here for the Learning House Professional Development Best Practice courses, um, because they're only five weeks, there's a little bit more of a crunch time in getting to those students initially. We normally have all of our instructors meet, or I'm sorry, send out an email to missing students who haven't participated the first three days. But the point being is here's an example of an easy, um, nice little grabbing. Are you still with us? We'd love to have you on board. Not too late to be there. All right. For this standard, when we go and evaluate, we're going to first look at the grade book. And we normally would find what students didn't complete maybe that first week's assignment. After we find out that st a student who didn't complete an assignment, we'll actually go in and examine all of the instructor's messages that were posted in the LMS. It's really for this reason that we highly encourage you, you have your online instructors do all of the course communication through the LMS and not email. The LMS can track and it can archive all of that course communication. Um, unfortunately, we would not have access to individual school email accounts, nor do we also assume that the security of some of those school email accounts have not been forwarded by the student to maybe some unsecured commercial account like a Google Gmail or a Hotmail. So I can't reinforce it enough, the importance of making sure your online instructors use those LMS tools consistently. Okay. All right. Another standard that we evaluate in the online instruction rubric is form participation. And you noticed earlier in the previous slide we talked about the quality of form postings. Um, this is actually where we're looking at the quantity of form participa participation. And we had to establish a baseline for instructor posts. And when we actually evaluate form participation by an instructor, we will go into their Moodle activity report and we'll also look at the number of times in that activity report that that instructor posted. Uh, we'll then calculate the total number of student postings for the same forum. And we will have found that an exceptionally rigorous, active, engaging instructor normally will post 20% or greater of total class forum posting. The, the response rate is generally 20% or higher. That may equate to about posting four times every five days. All right. Ideally, we're working internally with our product development to work on reports that will actually call all that information automatically. Right now, we have to do it kind of manually, but it can be done. Um, when you only have one lesson with very few forum posts, we normally will try and select two or three lessons just to give us some kind of point of comparison. And 
really when we're trying to evaluate a course, we're trying to take the standpoint of the instruct benefit of the instructor. Where else do we think the instructor may have possibly um, participated in the class? If not in the forum, is there somewhere else in that course um, an announcement that we can see some kind of participation by that instructor? We try to really give the instructor the benefit of the doubt. Okay, and one of the last areas that we also evaluate I'm sorry, last two, is, um, is court university and course policies. Um, in this particular case, we know that most of you all have your university um, academic integrity policy, your netiquette policy, um, your accommodations of policy in your syllabus, standard documents. What we were looking for in this standard is that that instructor is reinforcing those policies throughout the course term. And in this particular example, um, we find that they've reiterated um, APA um, formatting, um, their, that academic integrity. They're really promoting it throughout the course term that you really need to adhere to APA citation. All right. Um, in this particular case, we had to dig a little bit further. We often had to use news forums. Uh, we had to go into actual assignment feedback, which is exactly where we found this. Um, we had to do pretty hard digging when we look for um, reinforcement of university and course policies. The last rubric, I'm sorry, last standard, is student pacing and keeping the student time on task. And in this particular case, um, we're really trying to see if the instructor just doesn't leave the student hanging after that first few weeks of the course term. In this particular example, the instructor actually posted a reminder about the upcoming project due. Um, not only did they post an upcoming reminder, but they also created a forum so that students could actually maybe post last minute questions they had. Uh, it gave that, those students a chance to maybe um, field some maybe problems or issues that that instructor can kind of mine in the forum um, and could discuss before that student had, had to turn in that final project. When we search for an instructor's ability to keep students kind of paced or time on task, we again wanted to evaluate news forums. Um, we also looked at news announcements. We also would find maybe even chat sessions were created, and in some cases, synchronous sessions were created. Some individuals, you may have questions as to how long did this whole evaluation process take? And in this particular situation, um, when we looked at a course, if we had very little communication throughout the course by the instructor, it could take as little as 15 minutes to do an evaluation. However, if we had a course that had a particularly rigorous um, instructor uh, interaction throughout the whole course term, it could take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. And I do want to also introduce um, a colleague of mine, Janice Balden Guter, who is another professional development administrator. Janice and I actually sat down and we together looked at the same 20, 25 courses. And we looked at, had the same rubric. We wanted to flush out um, inconsistencies of where we looked. Um, did we have um, changes that she looked one way, I didn't look another way, to really make sure that this rubric was pretty well foolproof for the most part. So Janice was very well helpful in um, making sure that we tidied up this rubric before we actually um, unveil it today to you all. And again, the actual print form is on the back table, uh, very simple two-page form. On the third page, there is the group work and synchronous session. On the group work, we only really had one standard to measure, and that was really the instructor's interaction in the group work itself. Under synchronous session, we divided into not only the quality of the session being led, but the behavior of the instructor during the session. But just want to reiter reiterate that most institutions do not require group work or synchronous session. So unless it was present in the course, we didn't evaluate it. And we didn't ding an instructor for any points if it wasn't there. So 
This is actually um, the final pr print product that can be easily done by hand. Um, our product development team has done a great job in working to um, put this actually on partner, por partner portal. Um, and your account manager will have more background about that too if you have an interest in this particular tool as well. At this time though, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Dave who's going to give a little bit of um, suggestions for recommendation, recommendations for using this particular tool. Is the rubric available um, in this? Um, actually, um, I do not think it is on your flash drive. That's why I have copies in the back. I would be happy, I've also left my business card back there. You'd be happy to email me. I can also give you a print copy as well. I can email it to you after the conference is over. Not a problem. Yeah, so just a few, a lot of ideas in your book about how you could use this tool, there's lots of different ways to use a tool like this. Just a couple of points that, that come out of my experience is use it to set expectations for practice. When you hire somebody, you have good practice around it. They need to see When, when we teach BP 101, you want to teach to the rubric, in a sense. You want to teach people how to do everything in that rubric. If this is what good teaching is, let's make sure that we train them and orient them and give them the right training so they know how to do this kind of thing in the, in the classroom when they get there. Establish a procedure. I said when I was a high school principal that I was required to observe the faculty members so many times a year. Uh, I've worked in the, the for-profit sector and we would have clear policies there that I would think that you could all develop what makes sense for your institution. But a first time faculty member would be observed the first week they taught any, any new course first time out. Again, probably in week three or four and again maybe in week six or seven. So typically three times for a brand new faculty member first time out because you want to get them off on the right foot. You want to get that person really feeling confident about what they're doing. If there are some things that they're not sure about or are not clear on, you want to catch it early and not wait till they, they've taught for you for two or three terms. So uh, veterans that have been well established, that have taught many courses, you maybe check them once a year, whatever the cycle is that makes sense for your institution. But it's pretty obvious that new people, you'd want to check them earlier and more often and then as they get adept and, and show good skills, you can slow down on that process. And then I would highly recommend if your institution doesn't have policies in this regard, you can do this when you start online because it's kind of starting from scratch or starting new. Include this data in an annual performance review with your faculty members. Uh, this is a good chance to give them feedback to bring it all together. You may have student evaluation data that you pull from the partner portal. You may have uh, class GPA and grade distributions. Uh, there's different sources of information, but if you've done two or three observations of that faculty member, maybe they've used this to do a self-review, all that data comes together in a nice package that you can use in an annual performance review primarily to set goals for that faculty member to help them identify training they want to go to, professional development activities, if you'd like to use them, to, like I said, to lead a workshop or so forth that getting in that habit and having that practice of an annual review where you incorporate this data with other data is a great practice to help that faculty member get better. And believe me, they appreciate the investment of your time and energy because it's an investment in them. It's a commitment to them and to help them grow and develop. And 99.9% .9 of them appreciate that and want that and are grateful for the investment you make in them. I'm going to dovetail a little bit of what Dave was saying. Um, I actually taught uh, BP 102 
this past uh, May. In fact, I have at least one of my students in the very back. And I actually incorporated many of the standards in here while I was teaching the class. And I would have to say, and Mark, you can certainly chime in, um, it does make it a much more rigorous um, process, not only for the instructor, it makes it much more engaging. I found uh, discussion forum postings were much richer, especially when you are um, adhering to putting in, um, re referring to outside sources, referring back to textbook, lecture material. There's just more meat uh, that your students can grab onto. It's, it really is a richer and more dynamic uh, form discussion. I found um, many of the students uh, appreciated it. They would write back and message to me, can you give me more information about where you found that source? Um, I really appreciated that. It was almost like they're hungering for more than just, good job, appreciate your time, thanks a lot. Um, so using this myself, it was really a very, it, it took a lot of um, really conscious decision to really, especially on the feedback, um, adhering to many of these forum uh, requirements as well. For those of you that couldn't hear, Mark said, Mark Sanford is the program coordinator for the Friends University online programs. And he said it really did accelerate the discussion. So we're trying to capture this on video. So we're going to start using the mic here. Yes. If anybody has questions, if you feel comfortable going to the mic, by all means, please do so. Appreciate it. Mimi, while that's happening too, I'm going to hand out the copies because I want that people to good. see this and they may have good. questions about the form itself. It's a fairly large conversation at our college, um, Mary Grove College in Detroit, about whether instructor participation in the discussion board causes an artificial situation among the students and makes them more performance oriented than actually deep discussion oriented. Most of our discussion board work is done with graduate classes. What I found is when, and Mark, of course, chime in here, when I was able to refer to an outside source, and because the, our best practice courses don't have a textbook, there's really only a lecture, uh, when I tried to incorporate lecture components, um, cite where that occurred in the lecture, and even mostly go to outside references that incorporated many of the topics or themes of that week, I felt that, um, and Mark, you may have seen this or not, students started to grab onto that. And they started to actually do it themselves. When I would cite an APA, an outside source, in the forum posting, I, f I also saw students start to do it as well. It's a great way, st if we teach students how to cite sources, this is a great way where they're visually seeing that citing being done. Um, Go right ahead. I hope that answered your question or at least added to it. Well, thanks to, to you and your team for your work on this. I think it's a great tool. Um, looking at item number four, the uh, forum participation, I, I wonder, um, I'm just trying to wrestle in my mind, maybe you could help clarify. When you talk about 20% or greater forum uh, participation posting, uh, within the framework of Moodle, if you're wanting to give individual feedback Moodle does not provide that framework for an instructor to give individual feedback on that forum post. So therefore, the instructor, what I've been advising my instructors to do is to utilize the message. And someone might say, well, you could go to the grade book and give feedback in the individual grade book, but if you're implementing a master uh, uh, course philosophy, non-editing teachers cannot edit the grade book for feedback. So again, if I want to give personal individualized feedback, I have to go through another medium. I'm just wondering how you wrestled that or how you overcome that obstacle to come up with this language here. Because it seems to me, at least from my experience, you know, it might be penalizing, if you will, if we were to adopt it this way, if that makes sense. See if I understand your question right. So it's a discussion board question in a post and faculty members responding to students. In some cases, you want to respond in the open forum for all the students Correct. to read. Correct. Other cases, you want to go just one-on-one -on -one with that individual student. So you go outside the forum to a different avenue in 
Correct. And some of our courses are very uh, uh, clinically based and so forth. So they might not be something that you would yeah. broadcast in an open sense. So you want to be in more individual. So if they go to a message area yeah. that doesn't account for that engagement activity. They don't get credit in a sense for 20% of the participation. That's correct. That's correct. Was, uh, and again, if you look else. at a master it's course a philosophy, question. when you have three or four courses and right. you, non, you provide non-editing rights to those instructors, they can't go to the grade book and provide that individual feedback. They have to go to the message. Good point. I think for the most part we had to have at least some benchmark and that's where the 20% started. We actually looked at some of our um, very, um, very good best practice instructors who had very high interaction in their courses and we started to figure out who had high, what was the percentage that those really engaged best practice instructors had and we used that 20% for that number. Can it change? Absolutely. It's a working document. We just had to use something, and we took who we had, the inf data, data we had, to use that as a benchmark. That's a good piece of feedback that we may think about incorporating. I would just recommend to you, add your own piece to this. I mean, you can take this and modify right. it as you want, too. Good point. My question somewhat applies to all of the points mm -hmm. um, on your, on the sta of these standards. I'm wondering if in your research, did you look at workload of the instructors? In other words, if I have one online class that I'm teaching and I have 15 students, I can give mega feedback, which would apply to all these standards virtually, except perhaps to the college policies and reinforcement and so forth. Um, and that's the touch point here I'm hearing. As instructors, we need to really be patting on the back and encouraging and walking side by side. But we also know that online teaching requires a whole lot if that's what, what we need. It's, it's a, a huge time investment on our part. So as you analyze, I mean, I felt a little sorry for the instructor who was just able to say, good job, well done, because that seems like it's not enough. But if that instructor has 150 students, that may be a whole lot better than nothing at all. So I'm wondering, when you analyze this, I heard you just say you went to the best practices, you know, those who were mm -hmm. doing that type of course. But anywhere along the line, are you looking at instructor workload and number of students that they're trying so hard to actively engage with? Um, two points I'm thinking of right off the bat is, no, we didn't look at workload. Uh, that's probably an individual campus institution um, really gauging. And I would, that's probably something to be c considered when you're evaluating an instructor. And I would recommend using an evaluation over more than one course term if you're using this as some type of an instructor review. Um, with regard to workload, though, you bring up a good point because there is much more engagement, uh, textual engagement with that instructor. What some really um, savvy online instructors do, and I'm gonna point out one of them who teaches our BP course is Brooke Schreiner over in the cor um, corner. Many of them, because they teach the same course semester, or course term, course term, they will have, to a certain degree, somewhat canned responses and they're beyond the good job. They, if they know there's typical topics, themes they're gonna be covering each and every module, and they have certain, um, they will capture certain responses that maybe allude to maybe a, the chapter, and they'll hang on to that course term, so it does help them when they do have a high load um, to get through forum postings and to respond a little bit quicker and all. So, um, Dave, you may have a little bit more to add than what I have. Just a little bit. Yeah, it's impossible for us to know what the load is when you write a form like this. So obviously the administrator, the leader, has to use this and add judgment to it. Although good instruction is good instruction. If, you, if you're loading faculty up so heavily that they can't really teach well, that's a, that's a different issue, right? It's an administrative issue to deal with. Uh, I would give a word of caution on that, the canned response item. My wife took a class <coughs> from an institution that will remain nameless. And the fact that she had a faculty member giving these nice responses, then she realized it was the same response right. to the same student <clears throat> in the same class. So you gotta be careful if you do that yeah. to make sure it's appropriate. You don't do it two or three times to the same student. Hello, my name is Janice Baldwin Gutter. <clears throat> and I worked with Mimi on the end um, of developing the rubric. Mimi had 
done most of the work and I came in late. Uh, one thing I did find, I was amazed, that as an online instructor, I had been for eight years, the content of what Mimi had done um, was right on target as far as what I had been evaluated by from the um, school that I taught for. So a lot of the research, all the research Mimi had done was right online as far as what I normally had been evaluated by, by the online. Uh, as far as the discussion board, I am required to be in every other day. The number of postings. As far as the uh, grading and the template you just discussed, and Mimi and I had not talked about this before, but uh, how I learned, because I uh, had been evaluated, how I learned to work with that is, number one, when I give the feedback, use the student's name in the first line of the feedback. Second, find something in, you're grading the paper anyway, find something in the paper that you can relate to, good job on how you developed whatever is in the paper, all right? Just a brief line. Then after that point, if you have a standard template, mm. put it in. But that lets the student know that you are addressing them personally, mm -hmm. you have read the paper, uh, and you've pulled out something, even just one small point, uh, and then use your template, very good. Mm -hmm. So that addresses the question of really the length of time, and it is a length of time, uh, especially when you're teaching two or three classes online, but it gives, when you do it that way, you've used the student's name, this personalization, you've picked out something from the homework, and he knows you've read it, and then you can do the standard template. So uh, mm -hmm. I, Mimi did a fantastic job, uh, and this is an independent assessment <laughs> separate, <laughs> separate from, uh, because I didn't come in till late on this, so I could look at it and say, wow, this is what I have been evaluated by. But if you go to that formula, use the student's name, uh, point out something in the feedback that they've done well, just one line, and then use your standard template, it will significantly increase your uh, grading time to help account for some of that workload. I know we're down to about the last five minutes. Are there any further questions? Brooke, it looks like you're coming on up. Not Brooke. really a question. Good. Hi, I'm Brooke Schreiner. I contract with the Learning House to teach their best practice, um, the one-on-one -on -one course. Um, I just had a quick word of wisdom, my two cents, um, about how to do this in your work naturally. Like how do you incorporate this just as you're typing with your fingers and you're thinking in the classroom? without having to refer back to the rubric. Something um, that I talk a lot about with, with the BP students that I teach is developing an empathy for your students. And one of the best ways I think to do that, um, to think like a student, is to take a class online, um, which the BP course um, helps instructors do that. But if you don't take that course, um, then any other way that you can be an online student will really help develop that empathy to help you do this naturally. Um, be just a part of kind of who you are. So. Good point. Right. And just jumping in a little commercial and advertisement with what Brooke was saying, we have three best practice courses, uh, BP 101, which actually started Monday. Our next session, unfortunately it's full, is August 20th. Uh, we have BP 102 that will be starting, I believe it's September uh, 15th, I believe. And then we have BP 103, which will be October 15th. Um, the BP 101s are generally run every month. So if you're on our training newsletter, by all means, that's the best place you will find out the uh, dates that when those are run. So. Uh, August 20th. Yes. If you, if you email me your business cards sure. back there, she'll get you on the list so that you get the updates from the training department each month. They list all the schedule of when those are offered. In addition to those three standard courses, they're doing more and more workshops on special topics, and you'll see more of those coming. At some point before too long, we're going to start asking you folks to start making presentations for us. You've got great faculty members. You've got great best practices. We like to kind of create a place where we can share best practices, so you should be doing some of those workshops and presentations to share what you've developed at your campus with the rest of the partners. So that's coming later this year. 
I have one question, but we'll let you folks go then since you don't have any more questions for us. How many of you are currently using some rubric like this, either a homemade one or one that you found from another institution? And uh, <coughs> that's good. So here's another option for you. And uh, appreciate your attention and time here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.